this morning, for he is Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. Let's give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. The heavens declare.
Jesus Christ, who is the Lord. He is the King above all kings. Thank you, Father God, for your Son, Jesus, this season, who came to save us all. Hallelujah. comfortable, just lift up your hands and let's just magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, we just thank you that not only do you have love, but you are love. And your love never fails, never quits, never gives up. And you never gave up on your plan. And your plan was to restore us. Your plan was to redeem us. Your plan was to make us your partner 
your agent, your representative, that you could reproduce yourself in and through us. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you obeyed and you paid the price that God's love dream could be restored and that we could once again be one with Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that your love never fails, never quits, never gives up. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, even in this season. Father, where decisions have to be made, governments, Father, are wrestling with challenges that are greater than what a man can solve. I'm asking, Father, you give divine wisdom. You give divine direction. You bring light. You bring the right people into their pathway. That, Father, there can be a word in due season that your purpose can prevail and that, Father, that your plan can be fulfilled in every nation of the world. And, Father, I thank you. During this time, so many are struggling in their emotions. I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace. And I'm thanking you, Lord Jesus, that you grant each one that is dealing with any kind of anxiety, any kind of pressure or stress. Father, I just thank you for strengthening each and every one of us just to roll our care upon you, give our concerns to you, give our worries to you, leave our burdens in your hands so that your peace that passes all understanding can guard our hearts Grant each and every one of us vision, new vision for the coming week. That, Father, there is an excitement, there is an energy in our lives that we recognize that we're not bound by the past, but, Father, we are energized and empowered by all the powers of heaven that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is inside of us to lead us and to guide us and to direct us right into a greater dimension of your plan this week. And Father, I just thank you that not only did you save us from our sins, but you healed us of all diseases. And I thank you, Father, right now, that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed, and if we were healed, we are healed. And I thank you, Father, for your healing power flowing into our bodies right now, affecting a cure and a healing in our bodies, driving out sickness and disease, causing what is wrong to be righted. Father, replacing what needs to be replacing, renewing what needs to be renewed. I thank you, Father, that you were not the God who used to heal. You are the God, our healer, Jehovah Rapha. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Father, as... We look to you at this time. I thank you that you're our source. Father, we're not self-made, we're God-made. And we trust that you will direct our steps and lead us in the right way. That, Father, your provision will be seen in our lives. You open doors for us of opportunity. Father, I thank you for meeting our needs. And as 2021 is coming to a close, we declare, Father, it is not a lost year, but, Father, it is a year of the Lord. It is a year of turnarounds. It is a year of breakthroughs. It is a year of increase. Father, I, we release our faith in you to cause us to finish strong in this year, that we'll be able to look back in this year. And as we've been singing about, we can say, we won't say, well, where has the time gone? We'll say, look what the Lord has done. He's been faithful. He has been true to his word, true to his character. He's been good to us. And we give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, welcome to Faith Christian Fellowship. We're uh, privileged and honored that you have joined us. And we know God has good things in store because he's a good God and he does good things. 
and he's always up to something good and he wants to overwhelm you with his goodness today. I just want to encourage you that he's no respecter of persons. Any good thing that he's done for anyone, he's done for everyone. Let's do the confession. Did you know that we are the key to the change in our nation that we're wanting? God told Kenneth Hagin for the things that went wrong in the US, U.S. years ago. The church is responsible for what went wrong. And things are wrong now. And God is holding the church responsible to change the nation. And so that's for us individually and corporately. And uh, revival is about to break out, but we got to we got to start it. We got to be on fire. And so that's what we're believing for. Let's say it together. I am blessed. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am loved. I am healed. I am free. I am prosperous. I am talented. I am creative. I am confident. I am secure. I am disciplined. I am focused. I am prepared. I am qualified, I am determined, I am equipped, I am empowered, I am motivated, I am valuable, I am anointed, I am accepted and approved, I am not average, I am not mediocre, I am a child of the Most High God, I will become all that I was created to be. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand, let's make our confession, let's release our faith in the unchangeable one. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. Never the same. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated in His name. Well, it's a privilege and an honor to have you with us today during this Christmas season. And today, as we just take time to reflect upon the tremendous story of Jesus' birth and God's remarkable plan of redemption for mankind. You know, it's, it's hard to believe that Christmas is only a two weeks away. In a couple of weeks... Christians from all over the world are going to pause to celebrate the birth and the entrance to this world of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, many people don't realize this, but Dr. Seuss wrote How the Grinch Stole Christmas as a protest against commercialism during the Christmas season in 1957. I wonder what he would write today if he realized what our culture is like even now. We all know that each and every one of us can yield to greed and self-centeredness to really obscure the true meaning of what Christmas is, what the entrance of Jesus into this world really means. And yet, if you were to ask uh, even Christians, could you tell me what is the true meaning of Christmas? I think that most of us would struggle to, to tell anybody exactly what is the significance of Jesus coming to this earth. And of course, we all know that Jesus came to this earth as a baby born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. But what does that have to do with my daily life? How does that help me I as I'm fighting life's battles? Well, let's just read a portion of the Christmas story in Matthew 1. Verse 18 says, This is how Jesus, the Messiah, 
was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want to talk to you today about the good news of Christmas. Many times we think of Christmas simply as the birth of Jesus, as a baby. But the birth of Jesus is only part of the good news of the plan that God has for all his people that he created. You know, the world has suffered a lot this last couple of years because of COVID. There's been a lot of mistrust, a lot of depression, a lot of discouragement, a lot of fear, a lot of apprehension. And people are looking for answers. But thank God the church has the answer. Our answer is found in hope in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, no matter what people are looking for today, Christ is the answer. Faith in his finished work is the answer. He has done everything that needed to be done to cause us to be everything God wants us to be. And I don't think any of us envisioned when we first came into this, that we would be dealing with this virus so long. I remember even last New Year's, a half of the body of Christ were saying, this thing is going to be around for a while, and, and it's going to be one virus after another. Half of them were saying, no, it's broken. It's going to be done in a couple of weeks. But it's something that we don't know. But there are things we do know. And what we do know is what God had in plan when he sent Jesus, was part of a master plan to restore humanity back to him. And what God has done is marvelous. And we're, we're all waiting for things to change. And we're praying and we're trusting that this season that we're in, as far as COVID is going to stop, it's going to be broken, we're going to get life back to normal. I know that our niece had everything ready to go to Australia to celebrate Christmas with her brother and their family. And, of course, Australia's closed the borders. Can't go. And then our niece's mom was going to send a, a little package, not much bigger than a letter. And they said, no, Australia's not even receiving mail from Canada. They, they don't want to get infected with what would be on the letter. And it, it's just a different season that we're in. But one thing that doesn't change is what God has done. What God has done is relevant. And I want to share that. When we think of the Christmas story, we realize that the people in the Bible were waiting for things to change too. They were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Savior. And you know that they were waiting from the time of Adam and Eve's fall in the garden till the time that Jesus came. Generation after generation, century after century, uh, the, the people of God were believing that the Messiah would come in their lifetime. And they were putting their faith out uh, for that to happen. But thank God it did happen. And he has come. Now, if you don't know the Christmas story, I just want to remind you that the Christmas story and the gospel of Jesus Christ are one and the same. When we think 
of Christmas and we think of the gospel, we're thinking of exactly the same thing. T.L. Osborne said it like this. He says, the gospel is never preached unless we talk about four things. Number one, God's creation. God, how it started in the beginning. God's original plan. His original dream. His love plan for humanity. We have to understand, if we're going to understand redemption, we're going to have to understand God, how, what God planned in the beginning. That's the plan that's never changed. That's what he's redeemed us back to. So what was God's plan in the beginning? W creation. Then Satan's deception. How we messed it up. Third, God's substitution. The provision of Jesus, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And then our restoration. What are we going to do about what Jesus did? And so we must understand all those four components. And so first of all, we'll talk about God's creation. We have to understand why Jesus came. And if we're going to understand why he came, then we're going to have to go back to the beginning to realize what God's original plan and what his original dream was that he established in the Garden of Eden. Because the will of God was carried out in the Garden. The same way it was carried out in heaven. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no discouragement. There was no uh, hurt. There was no shame. There was no death. It was a picture of heaven. There was no poverty in the Garden of Eden. We often refer to heaven as the land of no more. You know, there's no more funeral homes. There's no more hospitals. There's no more uh, pacemakers. There's no more wheelchairs. There's no more crutches. There's no more graveyards. There's, there, there's no sighing. There's no dying. Heaven's a wonderful place. Well, that's exactly what the Garden of Eden was like. It was a replica of heaven. And we know what, that's how God originally planned it. When he placed his creation in the garden. When he put Adam and Eve in the garden. As a representative of the human race. They were put in a land of abundance. And one thing that you wouldn't find in the Garden of Eden. You would not find natural disasters. Adam and Eve did not have to deal with flooding. They did not have to deal with forest fires. They did not have to deal with tornadoes. They did not have to deal with devastation. They did not have to deal with a snowstorm. One of our uh, a couple from the church here uh, came to a connect group last Wednesday, and they drove for almost an hour without being able to see the center line on the highway because of the snow and the storm. Uh, there was none of that in the, gr in the garden. Are you going to miss that? <laughs> and we understand that when we look at the beginning, this was God's plan. God's people were never to be stressed out and to be burdened and to be beat down and shoved down and living wi under condemnation and guilt and shame. That was never God's plan. For the Garden of Eden, it was never God's plan for man. Uh, we recognize it's not going to be like that during the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign. It's not like that in heaven. And this is what Jesus came to do, is to restore even the earth back to its original state. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 8 that even the earth is groaning today, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of, of, of man. You know, even the earth is waiting for the church to rise up and be the church so that this earth can, can get back to its original condition. Also, uh, we, we recognize that creation was a picture of what God had for man. When Adam and Eve were created, God breathed his life into them. They had the life and the nature of God inside of them. They... They walked with God. They were his companion because God's dream for mankind was that he would reproduce himself in his offspring and that he would have companionship with them. That was his original dream. That's his dream today. 
that he could reproduce himself inside of us and that he could be seen in and through each and every one of his children. And when we think of how it started in the beginning, that God put one condition on Adam and Eve because he wanted them to want him as much as he wanted them. He wanted them to prove that they loved him as much as he loved them. So he put just one condition that they would keep their hands off the tree of knowing good and evil. And they were expected to have confidence in what God said. And that's all God requires of you and me today, that we believe what God says he means. That's all God's looking for. But he's given us a free will. And he's given us a choice. And we can choose him or we can reject him. And so, the first of all, was creation which gives us a picture of what God has in mind for his creation. Secondly is Satan's deception. When the tempter came, when temptation came, when the serpent came, when Satan came through the serpent, he came to deceive Eve, and what did he attack? What God said. His words were, hath God said. And he tried to get Adam and Eve to doubt the integrity of God's word. That's what sin is. Sin, the sin that caused the fall. Sin that separated us from God. Sin that drove Adam and Eve out of the garden of abundance and plenty was not because they got caught smoking or drinking. Or they got caught you know, with some addiction, or they got caught doing some immoral act. What drove them from the Garden of Eden was sin. And that sin was disobeying God's Word, ignoring the integrity of God's Word. That's what sin was originally. That's what it is today. And so when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were driven from that uh, Garden of Plenty. They, this, the nature of Satan was transferred to them. That's why every single person from Adam all the way to uh, this present day must be born again. Because we need a new nature. And so there is God's creation. Then there is Satan's deception. But thank God, Jesus is God's substitution. God already had a plan in place. He already knew what he would do. He knew that the soul that sins will die. And we all know that the wages of sin is death. So Adam and Eve died. Not physically. They died spiritually. They were separated from God's presence and God's blessing. And we needed somebody to draw us back together again. So God needed somebody that was just like us that would take our place on our behalf and in our stead as a substitute that would pay the price for our, the punishment of sin and take the, not only the punishment of sin, but pay the penalty of sin and so that the innocent would pay for the guilty, that the, uh, the just would take the, the penalty for the unjust. And so God needed a substitute. And so Jesus, who had n was perfect, according to Philippians 2, says that Philippians 2 talks about how that he had a plan to send Jesus to us as our Savior, our substitute. Romans 5.12 says that because of the fall of man, center, sin entered into humanity and was passed on to all generations. When Adam disobeyed God, all of Adam and Eve's children right up until this day are born in sin. That's why every single person must put their faith in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus to be reinstated back into God's family. The Bible says that Jesus became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God. Genesis 3.15, God said to Adam 
and Eve, and also he had a word for the enemy. This is right in the Garden of Eden. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, that's Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God promised a Savior through the seed of a woman who would defeat Satan, hell, death, and the grave as our substitute to provide you a substitute who had no sin, God gave his own son. See, that, that's what Christmas is, is about. Jesus was born by a miraculous conception that we call the virgin birth. Isaiah prophesied this 700 years before Christ was born. Let's look at Isaiah 7, 14. All right, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child She'll give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus was born of a virgin, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. God was his father. Jesus did not inherit the nature that we all have inherited through Adam. He had the nature of God. He had the life of God. Mary provided the body. Jesus was actually born of Mary. He was the legal son of Joseph, but he wasn't born of Joseph because Jesus was born of a virgin. So God came to birth, came to earth as a human being in the womb of a woman so that he could one day die on the cross for our salvation. Christmas is the celebration of the entrance of our Savior into this world. The good news of Christmas is that God sent his son because he wanted to restore his family back to himself. You have to know that God longs for his people. He came to restore his family and he wants you to restore your family. You know, I want to emphasize God's heart as a father who wants to be with his children. Just think, when Adam fell, how God longed to have that companionship and fellowship with his family. You know, in the end of March of 2020, my dad was 98 years old, starting to fail. And he didn't have covid but the virus scare was just starting. <coughs> and, uh, you know, no one really knew, knew what to do. We had just been to our son's wedding in B.C. And, and back then, if you traveled out of the province, then you couldn't go to the hospital. You couldn't go to a care home. You, you, you had different restrictions because no one really knew what to do. So my dad would be calling day after day, please come. Please come. You know, a phone call didn't cut it for him. And so, you know, I would talk to him. The, the, the nurse would have a phone, and he would talk on the phone, and he'd be kind of short. If you knew him, he didn't like being told what to do. <laughs> and uh, this was ridiculous to him. He, he, that's not what he wanted. He had always been his own boss, and he always had done what he wanted, and here he is now. And he's on his, his last week on earth. And none of his family could be around him. And it just broke his heart. That was harder on him than being 98 years old and being weak. The hardest thing was not being able to have family around him. And sure, I, I talked to him in his last hour over the phone. But, uh, but it, it, it hurt. Just think about God. When Adam sinned. And we were separated from God. Just think about how that hurt the heart of a father. He had one desire. 
and that was you. He wants you around him. He wants you to be with him. He wants you close to him. He wants to be your companion. He wants to be for you. But he couldn't because of sin. But thank God he had a plan. And he had a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was willing to offer his own son to be a substitute, to be a sacrifice. So that we could once again be family. That God could be with us and we could be with him. That he could enjoy us and we could enjoy him. He could reproduce himself in and through us. He, he could work with us and we could work with him. We could be one with him. That was his original dream and he never gave up on it. Galatians 4, verse 4 says, But when the right time came, when the set time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, Verse 5 says, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us to be his very own children. That's what God did. Just at the right time, people were waiting for generations and centuries for him to come. They were believing for the Messiah. They were believing for Jesus to be born, to come to this earth and to deliver us, deliver us from sin, Deliver us from the curse. Deliver us from all the things that we see around us today that people complain about. Including ourselves. God has an answer. And his answer is found in his sinless son, Jesus Christ. You know, there was nothing unique about a baby being born in Israel that night 2,000 years ago, I'm sure hundreds of babies were born that night in Israel. But th this baby was different. There was no sin in him. God's blood flowed through his veins. God's life flowed through his lungs. He had never, he wasn't part of sin. He wasn't born of sin. He had a mother who is flesh and blood, but God was his father. He was perfect. Thank God for Christmas. He was 100% human. He was 100% God. And because of that, not only was he qualified to be our sin substitute, he also came as a person. So he could understand you and he could understand me. He could help you and he could help me. He could identify with us. We can identify with what he, who he is, but he came so he could identify with who we are. He experienced as a person what it is, what it feels like to be deserted by family and friends because he was deserted by family and friends. He was talked about. He was made fun of at school. He was bullied. They made fun of him because there was rumors going around about who his dad was. He, he was talked about. He was left out of the, the circle, the in crowd. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by a person that you poured your life into. He knows what many of you have faced even during COVID. He knows what it's like to stand by the graveside of somebody you love. He knows about all, all that. He knows about all the things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The Bible says that he was touched with all the feelings of our infirmities. He dealt with what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and he did it so he could help us. He identifies with us. That's, that's why he came. He's been here before. That's why the writer of Hebrews says in verse... 15 and 16 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses 
but one who has been tempted in all things, just like we are and yet without sin. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. No matter what we're going through, we can talk to Jesus about it. No matter what, how low we are, we can come to him as we are. No matter what's going on in our life, he knows exactly what is going on in our life. When we come to him, he doesn't say, you got to be kidding. What's your problem? Get over it. No, when we come to him, he knows what that's like. And he knows not just what we're, you know, it's one thing to, to identify with people. Yeah, I know, I know, I lost too. Yes, I know, I can't keep a job either. Uh, you know, uh, that's good to have that kind of support group to a, to a point, but it doesn't help us. Jesus not only identifies with our situation and our issues, but he knows how to get us over. He knows how to cause us to win. And so not only does he identify with us without hurting us and without condemning us and beating us up, but he accepts us as we are, but then he shows us our way up and our way through, and he gets, helps us to get the victory over it. Because then we identify with his triumph. So we come to him, and we, we, he causes us to live in a victorious way. He'll either show us how to overcome it or he'll give us the grace to go through it with a smile. You know, Jesus, he experienced every disappointment, every setback that you and I could ever experience, yet without sin. He's not only experienced and qualified to help us to win and overcome in every situation, but he wants to. And he's available. You know, uh, in this hour that we're in now, there's a lot of stuff that's just not available. How many have ever been on, a, on hold? With Jesus, you're never on hold. Never on hold. Wait time. One, one time, it wasn't just recently, the last, it was the last week. We were trying to check on something. And the wait time was over eight hours. <laughs> Jesus, there's no wait time. He's always available. You know, a relative of one of our people needed two stints put in this week because he was having heart trouble. But you know, the ambulance never rushed him to the mechanic. Never rushed him to the electrician. Never rushed him to the hairdresser. Why? They wouldn't have a hot clue what to do. They don't know. Where did the ambulance go? <laughs> to the place where they do these operations day after day after day. They do hundreds of them. Probably thousands of them. Maybe even more than that. They do them all the time. Why? Because they, they have experience. That's why we come to Jesus. Because when we come to him, not only does he identify with us, but he knows how to fix us. He knows how to help us. He knows how to get us over. And he redeems us. See, we were born into this world, and we were separated from God. We were born slaves of sin and of Satan. But the Bible says, for no other reason than the great love with which he loved you, he sent his son to pay the necessary price to set us free from the power of sin and the power of Satan, the power of sickness, the power of poverty, the power of lack, the power of condemnation and guilt and shame. He set us free. Redemption means we have a new master. Really, it's, it's, it's a purchase. He purchased us. Not only are we free from sin, and not only are we free from Satan, but we now have a new master. We're not free to do as we please. We're free to honor him and to bless him. When we enter into God's family, we do as adopted sons, meaning we have the same rights and privileges as God's beloved son, Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, at the right hand of the Father, doesn't have any more privileges and any more rights than you have as a family member in the family of God, in Christ. God doesn't love His Son, Jesus, any more than He loves you. Do you believe that? God views you just as He does His own Son because now you are in Christ he sees you sinless. He sees you righteous in spite of your flaws. Because he sees you through the blood of Jesus. He th sees you through Christ. That's why Jesus was born. Secondly, you have the same privileges of Jesus. The Son. That means you can ask for anything that God's promised in his word. 1 John 5, 4 says this is the confidence that we have in him. That if you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have the same position. We have the same privileges. Thirdly, we have the same power. The same power that was on Christ, in Christ, and worked through Christ is on us, in us, and works through us. The same spirit. The same life that was in him is in us as followers of Christ. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you, if you're a Christian. Giving you power over temptation, over stress, over worry, and ultimately power over the grave. Death cannot defeat you. I got a call from Leonard just a couple weeks ago, and he used to run our camera department. And he was just, he just uh, phoned to say, I just want to thank you for sharing the word years ago. Probably it was 30 years ago. He said he'd had a, an incident where he had to be rushed to the hospital. Life was in danger, but he had remembered one message where it said, the first words that come out of your mouth when you run into trouble will determine whether you win or lose because death and life is in the power of the tongue. And he says, I remembered that. And soon... I forget exactly the circumstance, what happened to him. And as things began to shut down, out of his mouth, because he, he remembered that we have the same power, we have the same privilege, we have the same position as Jesus. I will live and I will not die. I'm not trying to get healed, I am healed. I will recover. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This is part of the gospel. This is part of the Christmas story. Jesus didn't come just as um, one of these nativity scenes so we could take pictures around it. Jesus came to restore back everything that the first Adam had taken from us. We are adopted as sons into the family of God. That's why he sent Jesus. This baby that was born in Bethlehem so long ago was God's son manifest in the flesh. Jesus restored to us the dominion that Adam had. And the authority to rule and reign that Adam had lost, that's been restored to us. Just at our connect group last week, one of our people were telling them that they were in a bad snowstorm and they took authority over it. And God brought them home safely. They did that, not in their name, but in Jesus' name. On the authority that had been invested to them. Because they realized that the same privilege that Jesus has, we have. The same position he has, we have. Because we're seated together with him. In heavenly places. He's given us his name. He's given us his word. He's given us his anointing. To represent God. The way he really is. Jesus restored God's dream of reproducing himself in the lives of his children. And having our companionship and our partnership restored. Just think. Of what it was like in the garden. Now I'm telling you. We're not living in the garden of Eden. How many know that? 
we're far from paradise, especially last week. I'm thinking of the, of the bombers. I'm sure the fans were thinking, why couldn't have we had the game today instead of <laughs> that, that game last week? Why did we have to be out there cold? You see, we're not in paradise, but by faith, we can activate our rights and privileges in Christ. One day, Jesus is going to come literally to this earth. And he's going to rule and reign. And this earth is going to be just like it is in heaven again. But in the meantime, we're going to use our faith, right? And we're going to enjoy what he has for us. Jesus redeemed us from Satan, from sin, and he reconciled us unto God by humbling himself to die on the cross for you and I. And that's why Jesus came as a little baby in the manger. When he came, he didn't come just to have some pictures taken. He came so that he could redeem us and restore us and God's original love plan could go forth. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that the Christmas story is all about restoring your family. And anybody who wants to be restored can be restored. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Old things pass away. All things become new. No wonder the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest. Peace towards men. And Father, we recognize there's hardly ever peace towards men between countries here on earth. There are more murders, there's more problems than you could ever imagine. But Father, it's because we have forgot about you. And so Lord, we're reminded again this morning that God wants us, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what our mistakes, no matter what our past, no matter what we could have done or what we should have done, uh, he's, he's made the way for us. And He receives us just as we are. He's not going to ask us where we've been, what we've done, who we've been with. He just wants us to accept His love and just come as we are. So if, if you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or at one time you walked away from him because something bad happened and you think God failed you, I, and you realize today God's never failed anybody. What he's done for one, he'll do for anyone. He'll walk us through any situation, and you want to come back to him, he'll receive you, and, and he, he, won't, he won't condemn you. He'll take you back. And then not only will he take you back and you won't start from where you are, he will take you back and then he'll open doors of opportunity for you and he'll take you places you could never get on your own. So if you want to come back to him or you want to know him, God, God did the hard part. He did the heavy lifting. Our part's easy. I know many years ago, I didn't know the first thing about Christ. And all I did was simply ask him to change me. I just invited him into my life. And he accepted me. I don't know why he did, but he did. Because he's no respecter of persons. So whether you're in your home or whether you're here in the church, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you want to come back to Him, just pray this after me. If you believe it in your heart and speak it with your mouth, a miracle will take place. It'll be the miracle of Christmas. Christ will be born again in and through you. Let's all pray together. Say, I believe. Jesus Christ died for my sins. on the cross I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I may serve you all the days of my life 
Thank you for restoring me. Restoring my position. Restoring my dominion. Restoring my privilege as a child of the Most High God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, if you just prayed that simple prayer, you're a child of God in the family of God. Congratulations, that's the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life. You know that the family that you've been born into will outlive your own family. This is an eternal family. Uh, we have some literature we'd like to send you. Just uh, email the address on the screen. We'll be so honored to help you. We know that the best is right in front of you. God has good things in store. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. I pray that this Christmas season that you'll use every get-together as an opportunity just to love people, lift people, honor people, and let them know how much you love them. God's good. Amen. Have a great week. And uh, we just encourage you, just follow our ushers' instructions. They're anointed and appointed to be a blessing to you. God bless. <laughs>